All right, ladies and gentlemen, anything to report from the break? All right, then we will resume with uh, testimony and Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Detective James, you indicated that you volunteered to be a part of this search warrant team on March the 12th going into the 13th, 2020, correct? Yes, sir. How many times have you participated during the course of your career in the execution of search warrants, approximately? In the probably a hundred or more, probably hundreds. Have you ever had one that turned out like this did? No, sir. Did you have anything to do with the preparation of the search warrant affidavits or the investigation that led to their issuance? No, sir. You just got a, a phone call or text message asking to you to volunteer, correct? No, sir. It was a email. They sent out an email, I believe. I know at least one email, and then I think somebody, I was in the office one afternoon and somebody was going around saying that they needed help. Do you remember when that was in relation to March 12th or 13th? I don't, I mean, honestly. I want to say maybe maybe that week or week before maybe. Okay, so this wasn't a, on that day they called you and said, hey, come on out and help us? No. Okay. Um, now you said you responded or reported to the CID office that's on Ormsby correct yes sir and when you got there there were quite a few CID personnel people there yes sir do, do you know everybody in CID mostly yes sir do you work with a particular unit I do which one is that I work um, under the airport uh, interdiction unit um, uh, they deal with the parcel packages um, and then I actually was assigned to the highway. It's actually, a, a, it's like a dual interdiction. They do the airport stuff and then I did the highway stuff. Okay. And do you usually or frequently work with other unit members from different CID units? Not as often. My job was kind of unique. I, I went in and worked with the sheriffs more than I did our own unit most, some of the time, not all the time, but I did help out some. Somewhat. Okay. Now you indicated that when you got to the CID office, there, that was where the briefing took place before you went out to Springfield, correct? Yes, sir. And you mentioned something about packets are put together for each location. I believe there was packets out. Yeah. What would what's a packet? What what would be in a packet? Uh, it would be like uh, the location, maybe like a map overview, um, pictures. Uh, any kind of intel they would have, um, things like that. Do you recall seeing any map overview um, or pictures of 3003 Springfield? I don't remember going through the packet. I saw, I believe, a packet for it, but I didn't go through it, per se, like page by page or anything like that. Did anybody ever tell you the physical layout of the building at 3003? Uh, I believe that, yeah, they said it was an apartment complex, I believe. Did they ever go into any more detail? Did they tell you apartment four is there's another apartment right behind it? Uh, I don't recall that, no. Okay, so when you got there at the CID office, there's a whiteboard up there with everybody's assignment on it, correct? Yes, sir. Did you have anything to do with choosing your assignment? No, sir. Did you know all the guys that you were going out with? On, on with my group, yes. Yes. And you testified that your understanding was that the search warrant was for money or dope being stored there, correct? Or Yes, or both. Do you know, and I'm going to jump ahead here, but do you know whether the search at 3003 Springfield Apartment 4 was ever completed by CID? No, sir, I don't believe it was. Okay. Um, do you know how it got changed from a no-knock to a knock-and-announce warrant? No, sir, I don't. You didn't have anything to do with that, correct? No, sir. Okay. You testified that Mike Campbell was at the, at the location already. I believe he was, yes. And he was the eyes on or the VO? Yes, sir. And what was his, his function was to what, report anything that he saw unusual? I, yeah, I believe so. And to your knowledge, nothing unusual was reported? That wasn't, nothing was told to me. So you all went out to the staging area at a church. Where was that church? On Manslick Road, I believe. Is that Just near? Real close to the location, about 
I want to say maybe a quarter mile away or a mile, maybe, I don't know, not very far. Okay. You testified that there was an ambulance on standby at that location, correct? Yes, sir. And I believe I heard you say that that is usual when there's a search warrant being served. Yes, sir. Have you ever had occasion to need an ambulance? Uh, uh, yes, sir. And why is that? Uh, because uh, people were shot, uh, officers were shot. Is that something that happens on a regular basis? Uh, it happened one other time besides this with me uh, where I was, I wasn't involved in it, but the SWAT team was executing a warrant and one of the members were shot uh, executing that warrant. And, and that's, that's why you keep an ambulance close by, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and for the people that were serving the warrant for too. In case somebody there is injured during the course of that? Yes, sir. Now, you got, you, you testified that Jamarcus Glover was the primary target to your knowledge, correct? Yes, sir. How did you learn that? Uh, because of the briefing and then on the board, they had some names I will leave up on the board, on the side of the board there. And while you all were staged at, at the church, you were waiting to hear word that people, that that the search warrants on Elliot were, were in progress, correct? Correct. And then you got the word, and that's when you all started up toward Springfield? Yes, sir. I believe you testified that there was a Toyota Sequoia parked right in front of where you wanted to basically stage? or Pretty much, yeah, it was parked there. And, but it, was it occupied, to your knowledge? I don't know. I, I can't testify to that. I don't believe it was, but I can't say 100%. You indicated, that, did you have a specific role in this? I had that shield that uh, I had, I was, I was, I had the shield. Okay, and the shield is, you called it a ballistic shield, right? Yes, sir. I assume that's to stop bullets if they get fired at you. Yes, sir. How, how is it that you were not at the head of the, the stack to go into the apartment? Well, I was, that's why I was on the corner uh, setting, uh, not, I wasn't in front of the rest of them. Uh, Sergeant Manley was knocking, and and then uh, when the door came open, he just, you know, stepped, took a step in, and I, I couldn't get in front of him, and he already, drew, you know, he was already shot. And and you immediately attended to, to him. I tried to get him to cover. Okay. I was trying to get him to me. Did you see him returning fire? I did. And you saw Miles Cosgrove returning fire. Well, I didn't know at the time it was Miles, and I didn't really see it. I could hear it, and I could see somebody's feet right there, and then John, John or Sergeant Mattingly being right here. But I could see somebody right here by the doorway where, you know, I could hear the gunfire. You later learned that was Miles Cosgrove, correct? Yes, sir, I did. How would you describe that gunfire? Uh, it was very intense and very loud. By very intense, what do you mean? Um, very rapid and extremely loud. We were in that alcove and it magnified the sound of the, the weapons. Do you have any idea how many rounds were discharged? No, I mean, I know now, but at that time I was trying to, you know, not really, I was like, man, is that eight, 10? I mean, it was just a lot of secessions of, of gunfire. How long did that gunfire last, if you if you know or if you can estimate? I mean, it was seconds. It wasn't like forever. It was, you know, it was like, I want to say, I don't know. I, I can't put a time limit on it. I would hate to say a minute, and it's not a minute. But it, 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 it was extended period of time, but it wasn't just super quick. You know, it, it, it maybe, maybe. 45 seconds to a, to a minute or something, maybe something like that. It was very fast. But you don't know for sure. I can't put a time limit on it exactly to, to testify on the time. Do you know what Brett Hankison's assignment was that night? night? Uh, no, sir. I mean, do you know that he had a canine with him? Yes, sir. Um, did you ever see the canine, do you know his dog's name? 
Uh, yes, I do. Uh, if I told you Franklin, would that ring a bell? Yeah, absolutely, yes, sir. Okay. It is Franklin. Um, did you ever see Franklin out that night? Uh, not when we were there. Not while we were executing the warrant, no. What was what would hit the dog's role have been? Uh, once the location was secure, Detective Hankinson would have ran the dog in there to search for contraband. Was Detective Hankinson also expected to participate in making entry and securing the location? Yes, I believe so. He was with the rest of us there. Okay. But you didn't you don't know specifically what he did or did not do that night, correct? As far as his job duty there, I mean he was just, you know, in the stick with everybody else um, other than once we secured the location then he would run the canine did you ever see him discharge his weapon no sir did you see him engage with the fellow upstairs as far as talking to him yes yes and what was that all about do you know the guy I believe upstairs heard us knocking on the door announcing police and he was responding back down you know talking to him and that's when Detective Hankinson was like, get back in the house, police, get back in. And did that individual ultimately go back in the house? I believe he did. I didn't hear any more from him. Yeah, what was going on while that was happening? Uh, Sergeant Manning Lee was still at the doorway, and then he reengaged and started knocking again. And when you say started knocking, is he just pounding on the door? Yeah, he was pounding on the door, police. Search, you know, police come to the door, search warrant police. He was verbalizing police? Yes. You heard that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I think you testified that as soon as Mike Nobles hit that door and it came open, do you know how many times he had to hit it? I believe he hit it three times. Okay. And as soon as it came open, is that when you were met with gunfire? Yes, sir. Where were you at that point? Um, I was to the left. Do you want me to show you on the thing, or? Well, we don't have it up there. But okay. were you still? You were still to the left of the door. I was still to the left of the door. With your shield. Yes. And did you have your weapon drawn at that point? I did. Did you slide around when the shot was fired and look into the apartment at all? No. I I basically backed up because I saw John in the doorway. As he's returning fire, he takes like a step back and goes down. And my primary objective was to grab him and pull him out of what we call a fatal funnel right there. You don't know what Brett Hankison was doing, correct? No. Um, do you know how many of the, there were a total of seven of you fellas out there doing the search warrant, correct? Yes, sir. Do you know how many were tending to John Mattingly? I know that. I know that I was there because I was putting the tourniquet on him. And that was a tourniquet that you had? Yes, sir. Was was John saying anything at that point? Uh, I think he was, you know, he was kind of in shock a little bit, you know, and saying I'm, I'm, I'm hit and uh, that was about it. You know, he was still kind of trying to get moving. Um, are you, are you meaning about when we got him outside? Was yes. he saying anything? Yeah, he, he was, he was talking about how much it was burning and hurting. Um, and then I had to, <laughs> sorry to ask you minute, this. Please.
Detective, I'm sorry to keep prying like that. It's okay. Um, you indicated that there was a call for an ambulance, correct? Yes, sir. Do you remember who, did you recognize how, or how did that call take place? Who did it? I, I didn't, I don't know who did. Hey, did I you, know somebody got him there. You didn't hear Brett Hankison call, is that correct? He, he could have. I, I really don't, I don't know who did. Okay, did you hear Brett Hankison go on the radio and tell the first responding officer to ram the gate? I heard somebody saying ram, ram the gate, ram the gate. Uh, I didn't know who that might have been, but I do know that somebody was telling them to ram it. And, and your testimony is that you don't know particularly what Brett Hankison did that, that evening, correct? I, I know he was with us, and I know that, like I said, that originally I thought he was at that doorway, and I found out later that he wasn't, that I guess he was in the parking lot in that area over in there. Well, but he was with, he was with you as you made the initial entry oh, yes, into the apartment. Oh, absolutely, yes, sir. Okay. And you don't have any idea what he saw. No, sir. You've never discussed this with him, correct? No, sir. I have nothing further. Anything on redirect? All right, you can step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, and the Commonwealth's next witness? Mike Nobles. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike <laughs> Campbell. Detective Mike Campbell. You go ahead and take a seat, please. And if you'd raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? So I'll help you, God. I do. Thank you. If you are comfortable taking your mask off with you while you testify, you may, but you're not required to. State your name for the record, please. Michael Campbell. And uh, how are you employed, sir? I'm employed by Louisville Metro Police Department. I'm a what sergeant in the second division currently. I'm sorry, I did I'm, not hear that. I'm a sergeant in the second division. A sergeant in the second division. Where's the second division located? It's the west end of the city. And how long have you been in that position? Since um, March of last year. Oh, yeah, March of last year. How long have you been with the department? Uh, since uh, 90, 96, 1996. 25 years? 25 and a little 25 bit. years. And um, so you've held various positions during all those years. Yes. And during all those years, have you had occasion to serve search warrants? Yes. Uh, many search warrants? A few. few. Yeah. Not as many as some people, but a few more than most. Yes. Uh, in March of 2020, what was your position? March of 2020, I was uh, a detective on the PBI squad in the interdiction division. Placed base Place initiative? Based, yeah, place based investigation. And uh, who was your sergeant? Uh, my sergeant was Kyle Meany. Ky sergeant Kyle Meany? Kyle Meany, yes. Okay. So you were aware of the investigation that your unit was conducting. Uh, regarding a group of individuals, uh, including Jamarcus Glover. Yes. Uh, did you have any participation in the actual obtaining of the search warrant for that group of um, houses and apartments? We, I helped conduct surveillance. When we were did in, surveillance. Yes. Where did you do surveillance? Uh, 
well, we did surveillance all over. We did it in the 2400 block of Elliott, and we also did it on Springfield and some other places also. And did you personally do some surveillance on Springfield? Yes. Were you aware of the, um, that Ms. Taylor lived at the apartment on Springfield? Yes. Uh, and did you know what kind of vehicle she drove? Yes. Which, and what kind of vehicle was that? It was a black charger that was, I believe it was a black charger that was registered to her. Okay, and had you observed that vehicle there at the apartment? Yes. Um, and what kind of, or uh, do you know what kind of vehicle Jamarcus Glover drove? At the time it was, a, I believe it was like a red, a red charger. Okay. Now, um, were you assigned to participate in the search that was taking place that night of March 12th? Yes. And which address were you assigned to? Uh, the Springfield address. And did you attend the briefing? No, um, I was the I was the eye, so I went out there prior to the briefing to see if anybody was coming or going from the address. So you went, you were the eye, meaning you were ahead of everybody else to go early to survey, do surveillance on the uh, apartment yes. or the, the complex. And so what time did you go out there? Um, to, I Spring, don't, to Springfield Drive. I, I'm not really 100% sure. It was, I believe it was 9, about 9 p.m. But you had been out there previously, you said, yes. doing surveillance. So you were familiar with the building uh, and the surrounding area. Yes. Did you uh, see anyone leave the apartment, uh, that breezeway into apartment four, during the time you were out there? No. Or any cars, anybody leave? No. Did you see anybody come back? No and enter the apartment? No. Okay. Um, and at that hour, it, it was dark. It was getting dark, yeah. Getting dark. It was dark. <clears throat> Did you see uh, the, the car that you believed belonged to Breonna Taylor? Yes, I believe and, it was out there. And where was it? It was uh, parked on the same side as the apartment, but it was a couple of spaces down from the breezeway. And so you didn't see anybody get in the car or the car didn't move? No. Right. At what point then did you, well, where were you parked to do the surveillance? Uh, I moved several times. Uh, at one point I was parked on Springfield at the end at Dead Ends by a dumpster. I parked there for a while. Other times I parked up it's like terraced, so I'll park up and look down. I was out there for several hours, so I moved several times. And did you have communication with the other members of the team that were going to execute the search warrant? Yes, by phone. And um, how did you meet up with them? Uh, when, they, when they arrived to do the search warrant, at that point, I was parked down by the dumpster, which is where Springfield dead ends and or takes a turn and as they came by i just met up with them as they came by so you met up with them as they were walking up to as they were driving up and then we parked. oh you drove your vehicle and met right. them and then what did you do uh we we got out of the the vehicles and we approached the apartment as you walked up to the apartment what uh what was the order of people walking up where were you where were you in that I was toward the back um, the first person first couple of people were like um, Anthony James then Sergeant Mattingly uh, somewhere in there was uh, Mike Nobles he was in front of me um, um, Lieutenant Hoover was there also and um, I'm trying to think who else um, um, I'm going to show you what's been entered as Exhibit 19. And 
it, that photograph is now on the screen behind you. And if you would take the laser pointer uh, and point out where. So how you approached the uh, stairway and, and the entryway there. So we came down this way and then we curled into here and um, Detective James was standing right around here. Sergeant Mattingly was right there, I think. Lieutenant Hoover was back over here. Nobles. And then I believe it was Hankinson and myself uh, were back over in here. More toward this end of the more toward here. Yes, at over. the end of the steps. Yeah. You and Hankinson. Right. He was somewhere in here. Uh, he was either I don't remember exactly where he was standing when we were out. Right. There, but I was using I was toward the back. Were you the you were the very last one? I believe so. At the end. I believe so. And so what happened then after everybody was in position? So we began knocking on the door. And who was knocking? Um I believe it was um it was I believe it was Sergeant Mattingly that started off knocking. And was um, continue on then what happened so we knocked for a really long time and uh, we had began uh, announcing that we were the police so it was really loud at that yeah. point yes and, um, and that's when a person from up here came out and um, we talked to him and he came out at the top of the steps yes on the landing yes and where you were, you were able to see him? Yes. And who began engaging with him? We all end up, were engaging him, but um, 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 Detective Hankinson uh, got him to go back in. What did he say to him? They were just really, uh, he was really assertive about going back in. They were loud. I was trying to keep an eye on this, this door, I mean this sliding door and that door. But everybody was yelling at them, and then they had a, a, a they had a loud confrontation, and he went back in. You said Hankison was more assertive with him. Yeah, you and he was the one who finally got him to go back in. He's the one that finally got him to go back in. Right. Uh, then what happened? Um, we stood there for a second longer, knocked a little bit longer, and then they said, "Oh well, I guess they're not coming to the door," and then. Uh, Detective Nobles hit it with the ram, and uh, I think it's laying down here somewhere. Hit it with the ram and hit it two or three times. It popped open, and when the door popped open, uh, Sergeant Manley started to step. He started to move toward the door, and that's when uh, the shooting started. He was shot at the doorway. Who who got shot? Uh, uh, Sergeant Battingly. And. Did you see anyone return fire? He was returning fire, and I uh, forgot, Detective Cosgrove stepped up and returned fire, and Mattingly pushed, uh, went against this wall into this corner where uh, Detective James was, and then um, shooting was, was going back and forth for a second, and then they, everybody rolled out into the parking lot. And where were you exactly when the shooting started? When the shooting started, I was right about here. And then when they rolled back out into the parking lot, I backpedaled back. Right. And did you return fire? I did not. Because you were out by the end of the steps. I was out here by the end of the steps. Where was Hankison? I don't, I don't remember where he was at that point. Did you see him shoot? I didn't see him shoot. So where did you go exactly? So after... Everybody pulled back. Uh, we started to treat Sergeant Mattingly for his gunshot wound. So you were helping do that? I was helping do that, and then I knew, noticed there was a bunch of people helping him. So then I went back to cover down on this on these door and this, one, and this door. Now, could you see through that sliding door? Uh, no, you could not. Um, did, and when you went back to start covering, did you notice it had been sh shot through? Noticed there was some uh, gunshots. I noticed there were holes in it that appeared to be gunshots. Okay. And you couldn't see through it. I couldn't see through it. Uh, 
ultimately, uh, you left the scene. Yes. And um, you went to Public Integrity Unit. Correct. And uh, you were interviewed. Correct. Okay. And that's protocol. Right. <laughs> Thank you. No further questions. Cross examination. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Campbell, do you know precisely how long you were out there with your eyes on 3003 Springfield? From about from about nine until uh, around eleven or so when we executed the warrant. Okay, and and you didn't see anybody come or go during that time. Is didn't that see correct? anyone come or go. Do you recall seeing a white Toyota Sequoia parked? That was the person who went up to the top. It was, he pulled up and he went up there. I didn't see, I believe that was, it was the one that was double parked. It was a white vehicle double parked out here. And that was the person who went upstairs. I didn't see anybody come or go from, from our target. Okay. When did the Sequoia arrive? Maybe 10 or 15 minutes prior to us executing the warrant. Okay. Um, but they went upstairs and it, that wasn't. Was that the same individual that came out? I believe so. And everybody engaged with and tried to get him to go back in? Correct. And you said Sergeant Hankinson was was very assertive in getting him to do that, correct? And he ultimately did go back in? He ultimately went back in. And then you described how there was knocking and announcing on the door? Correct. Do you know how long that knocking and announcing occurred? No, it went, it went for a long time. It went longer than we normally do. Um, can you tell us what what would be normal? Normal would be maybe maybe eight to thirty seconds of knocking, and before we get any response, this went on for a while. It went. We knocked for a while. Some time passed as we were knocking, and it got louder and louder and louder. Then that person came out. We engaged that talking to that guy, and then we went back to knocking some more. So it went longer. That seemed like a really long time to me. Do you, I mean, like a dangerous long time? Um, in hindsight, yes. But um, at the time, we didn't anticipate this happening. Did you know, or do you know how long it took to engage with the fellow no, upstairs? It, it didn't take a long time. The person upstairs? Yes. It, it, you know, it was go back, go back. It was loud. He finally goes back. He's like, what are you doing? He saw us, and then he went back in. And then you were positioned somewhere behind these steps? Kind of right around in here so that I could see that doorway and I could see that, that doorway. Okay, this is before the door was breached, correct? Correct. And everybody else was up there in that breezeway? Yeah, most people were in the breezeway. And did you see Detective Hankus in there? I don't remember exactly where he was standing. I, I know for a fact it was Mattingly, um, James, uh, Lieutenant Hoover, and um, um, Detective Nobles, and uh, Detective Cosgrove, for sure. I really don't remember exactly where he was standing when all this happened. Okay. Um, the door was breached. Sergeant Mattingly was shot. Do you know, what, what did you do at that point? Well, uh, everybody started to come back toward me, so I backpedaled back to cover in the parking lot. Did you see where Detective Hankison went? He, he was... Everybody came out of the breezeway. I don't know where any, there was no, none of us were up here at that point. None of you were up where? Up, up by the door at that point when everybody came out. Okay, well, as soon as that shot was fired, everybody got, we got start, out. well, there was shooting and um, in the course of the shooting, everybody rolled out of there. Do you know how many shots were fired? Quite a few. Do you know how long that shooting lasted? Really quick. I don't know. I have no idea. You can't put a definition on it. I can't put a really time quick. on it. No. Okay. Um, and you never, you testified you did not see Brett Hankison fire at all, correct? I never saw him fire a shot. Did you see him or hear him do anything after Sergeant Mattingly was shot? I remember he got on the radio and said that they were shooting at us with a rifle. 
I believe that came out. And then um, we all covered down and uh, covered down on the, the, the building, the apartment, and uh, we held it. And then um, um, when we made contact, he, uh, uh, he talked to Walker and got Walker, he, he got Walker to come out. He gave him directions when he came out. Okay, when you say when we made contact, you're referring to contact with Kenneth Walker? Correct. And you know now that Kenneth Walker was Brianna Taylor's boyfriend at the time? Uh, that's what I'm hearing now, yeah. And he's the one that fired the shot or is believed to have fired the shot? That's what, what we later found. And, and you just testified, what did Brett Hankison do with him? He, uh, well, he gave him directions as he came out. How did he do that? Can you? He was just giving him commands to come out, hands up, turn around, that kind of, just surrender, surrender instructions. And, and meanwhile, what was everybody else doing? Well, some people were treating uh, Sergeant Mattingly as he was leaving, trying to get him out. And I guess that, about that point, I think he was gone. And everybody else was covering down on the building. Okay. Can you describe the atmosphere during the period of time of that shooting? Chaotic. What do you mean by that? It was a lot like so, you know, an officer was shot, so there were tons of police coming. Uh, we were trying to get Mattingly out. Um, I'm, I'm going I'm to interrupt you here, and I'm talking about before Mattingly was, or right when Mattingly was shot, when the shooting was occurring. What do you mean? Like, what was the atmosphere? It was a, yes. it was a shooting, so it was, a, it was a lot of gunfire going on. Okay, and can you describe, was it loud? Yes, it was very loud. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else of this witness? No. All right, you can step down. Thank you. All right, the Commonwealth's next witness. Sergeant. Jason Tell me where the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Would you state your name, please? My name is Sergeant Jason Vance. How are you employed? I am currently employed with the uh, Administrative Bureau for the Louisville Metro Police Department. And how long have you been with the department? Been with the department for 16, a little over 16 years. In 2020, how were you employed with the department? So I spent uh, approximately five years with the Public Integrity Unit. I've recently transferred from the Public Integrity Unit in the last two weeks. Um, it's a unit within uh, Louisville Metro Police that the primary function or responsibility of the unit is to investigate officer involved shootings, um, but they're also tasked with investigating all crimes or alleged crimes by any Metro government employee. Public integrity unit. Correct. And on March 13th, 2020, did you get notice of an officer involved shooting on Springfield Drive? I did. And is that uh, specifically the address 3003 Springfield Drive? 3003, yes. And is that location in Jefferson County? It is. 
Uh, about what time did you get notice? Uh, it was around 1 o'clock in the morning on the 13th. Uh, what did you do at that time? I, just a routine response to an officer involved shooting. The um, Metro Safe Communications would uh, communicate that uh, each in in investigator within the public integrity unit to respond to whatever location uh, the officer involved shooting occurred at, which is the same in this case. Um, you respond uh, and you typically get briefed when you arrive to the location. So you did arrive at uh, 3003 Springfield? Yes. And what did you, you said you would get briefed, was someone there to brief you? Yeah, so typically the way it works is that, you know, uh, people, investigators respond not all at the same time, you know, just from, you know, some people are further away, and, you know, just there's lots of variable or, um, variables involved in that. So what we do is the first PIU investigator that gets on an officer involved shooting, uh, they try to ascertain as much information as they possibly can. And, and then they're required to, as the rest of the investigators uh, arrive to the scene, they would brief uh, the unit as a group of people. Um, and in most cases, uh, a lieutenant, the lieutenant of the, or the commander of the public integrity unit would then assign a, a lead and we go on a rotation, kind of like a homicide a rotation, homicide unit rotation. Um, and if you were next to uh, have a critical case, then you'd be assigned as the lead and, and then that person um, could divvy out responsibility. So they could say, you know, I want you to do my scene, I'm going to do this, whatever. So everyone has a task to do uh, after that briefing, and they know it. Now, had the scene been secure since the shooting occurred? Yes. So there were people on scene constantly after the shooting, once patrol arrived and then SWAT cleared the apartment building or the apartment. There was members of LMPD on scene from the moment the shooting occurred until I arrived. Yes. The 70 is an aerial shot of the St. Anthony Gardens uh, community, um, or, you know, apartment complex, community uh, complex, uh, and then there's an adjoining or adjacent um, series of apartments that um, are adjacent to that property. And 71? 71 is, a, a, is an overall or uh, aerial view of uh, 3001, 3, 5, and 7. Springfield and in the corresponding uh, addresses south of those buildings. And 72? 72 is a, a broader aerial view of St. Anthony Gardens, uh, encompasses uh, even further south. Um, the complex or community, you know, is on the side of a, somewhat of a hill. Um, so it goes, if you go south, it goes further in elevation. It's an aerial view of uh, 3003 Springfield Drive. And 74 is the 3003 Springfield Drive, and it is it's got identifying. Uh, it's identifying the numbers of each apartment within that building. That building is um, divided with south apartments and north apartments. And the north apartments would be, if you look at the opening in the building, would be the apartment doors that, as you walk into that opening, immediately face you the first and second level. It's 75. It is a... Uh, a layout of the apartment, um, apartment four. 
the floor plan? The floor plan, yes. Of apartment four and 76. It's a layout or floor plan of apartment three. And those photos you have reviewed and they fairly and accurately depict the scenes that you just described. Yes. Uh, Move to admit exhibits 70 through 76. No objection. They will be so admitted. Uh, in addition, Yes. And um, those have been marked 70A, 71A, 72A, 73A, 74A, 75A, and 76A. And you have reviewed those previously? Yes. And those are the same photographs that you just reviewed in the 8x10 size. Yeah, but it should be noted that the 8x10 eight eight size is going to be in, in width. Uh, of the image, obviously, it was going to be altered because uh, you know a viewfinder of, a, photo, of a, a camera is altered when it's printed, that, or that digital image is printed when it's printed. It's altered by the width because the eight by ten is not the true size of the digital image. It's more of eleven by twelve. So it may show more on the enlarged. Correct. Uh, you do have the mm -hmm. So. Yes. At St. Anthony Gardens? Correct. And where is apartment th or building 3003? Yes. But, ma'am, can you see? I don't, the juror, can, are you able to see? We can't see it. All right. Okay. I think we might need to set that back some. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sorry. We need to. We can use this ruler because we've got to be careful with our ladies being Yes. Okay, uh, and that is 70A. Now, could you flip that poster over the top and tell us what 71A is showing? It's a, it's a not as broad aerial view. So there are quite a few buildings in the complex. Yes. And go ahead and flip that uh, exhibit over to 72A. And in that exhibit, could you point out where the gate is that is uh, that leads into that area on Jason, the can you hear me? the gate? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a gate here. At the time this photograph was taken, there's a gate here that uh, doesn't allow the traffic to to or from Sandy Gardens to these adjacent apartment areas. So you would enter from the above. Yeah, so if you had a, a wider aerial view of that area, you would see that the road, the main road comes down and the entrance to St. Anthony Gardens is actually further south of the hill. Um, and as the community spans out, it goes down a hill and 3003 is the furthest north apartment building in the community. Okay, and that is 72A? 
Yes. So I'll go to 73A. And is that the, what building are we looking at here? 3003, that's a closer uh, zoomed in, if you will, arrow view of that, of that building. And where would apartment 4 be? The entrance? Uh, right, well, the entrance to the opening is kind of hard to tell. The number 4 is identified on the photograph. And where on the photograph is the apartment 3 back the sliding glass door from apartment 3? Yeah, so. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. I'm assuming this is the patio from that, from that, because there's a shadow from the photograph. But apartment three is immediately north of apartment three. They have a firewall that, that, uh, that separates them. It's 74A, the next photo. That's a, that's a street view, if you will, uh, of apartment uh, 3001 and 3003 Springfield, and the photograph notates the location of each number apartment four being the one here that advise number four three is immediately north of four four encompasses this these two windows and this patio slide glass line patio door. and go ahead and flip over to uh, 75 a what is this is a floor plan of the community apartments for apartment four. For the apartment four floor plan. So that's the floor plan for apartment four, uh, the subject of the search warrant. Correct. And where is the entry? the front door there to that apartment. Yeah, so the common entry point would be the front door, obviously, and it has one common entry point, three more possible entry points. Sliding glass door here from the patio that's uh, kind of subdivided from the, the sidewalk, but it's on this, you know, it's, it's almost in the same plane of concrete. Uh, then you have the two windows in each bedroom. That would be the parking lot below that, uh, Below the poster would be the parking lot. Yes, yeah, so these two bedrooms are these two windows here. This bedroom encompasses this portion of the brick. The, it's kind of hard to tell from the way that that apartment building, the photograph shows that because of the siding versus the brick, but this, this window is not so much centered in the bedroom. This is 75A. And again, the front door to apartment four is where? It's in the opening, the common area opening of the two-story apartment building. So go ahead and point it out on the dot, on the, this, right there. The okay. And then 76A. Now this is a, a floor plan for apartment three. Uh, this indicates where the Glass slide door, and in relation to four, so this entry door is here. This entry door at three is basically perpendicular to entry door four, indicated in this flat, this uh, layout. So entry door four uh, for apartment door, uh, four would be perpendicular to. This is an apartment layout immediately north of apartment. And where's the common wall? The common wall would be indicated as in the thicker black, uh, you know, indicating that's a wall. It's typically called a fire wall because they try to, when they, they build structure like this, they try to, you know, prevent fires from expanding from one apartment to the next. Okay, you can have a seat. Uh, Commonwealth would move to admit the. Uh, exhibits 70A, 71A, 72A, 73A, 74A, 
75A and 76A. No objection. All right, they'll be so admitted. Now, um, what did you do after arriving on scene and being briefed by uh, other PIU that had uh, previously gotten there? What did you do? One of the, one of the first things that, that I dealt with was the, to, um, to get people out of the scene. Um, you know, as, as most every officer involved shooting, um, you know, slowing things down for officers is important. And what I mean by that is, is um, slowing emotions down, um, and people coming in and out of the scene, preventing that from happening, identifying evidence immediately, and trying to preserve its position. Um, and that's part of like preventing evidence from being altered, not intentionally, but unintentionally. Um, so well, that was one of the first things that uh, the, the first sergeant, because in, in the public integrity unit at this time of the shooting, every investigator was a command officer. Um, and that is. That was uh, Sergeant Lee's was initial uh, job was to do that as well and to ascertain as much information as he could. So when I arrived, um, that's one of the things I, I started helping him with. Um, sergeant uh, Anthony Wilder, another sergeant in the public integrity unit, assisted me with that. Uh, we re we repositioned some um, uniformed officers to points that you know we wanted to keep people out of. Um, and, but we also were still trying to assess what happened. So we had apartment four and we also had apartment three. Uh, and we also had an issue of like, we wanted to make sure that no one else was hit in other apartments. So we had to go to other apartments or not necessarily me, but um, I assisted in making contact with in apartment three just because it was an obvious um, that ballistic pro or projectiles had entered that apartment. Uh, so I made contact along with uh, Sergeant Roof and Sergeant Lane with the the uh, occupants of that apartment. Um, now, did you learn that Miss Taylor had been uh, that she was deceased? Yes, I actually got, like I said, a further briefing uh, on scene uh, from Sergeant Wilder because Sergeant Lee uh, left almost. Uh, him leaving the scene coincided with me arriving in some in some okay, duration. So you, so you did learn that. Yes. And did you actually, on scene, speak to Miss Taylor's family? I did. Um, while we were trying to to uh, get crime scene unit technicians and and just resources to the scene to start, you know, our our responsibility, which is in documenting what happened. Um, I was notating vehicles uh, that were at, uh, parked in front of the buildings uh, on that side, on the 3003 side, um, and I was alerted actually by an LMPD officer that um, members of the Walker family were to the, to the east of the, um, the scene, so I made, I made contact with them, uh, and in the process of uh, speaking with the Walker family, um, they had contacted Brianna's mom by phone, um, and she was to report. You know, she was on her way to the scene. Um, that contact with the Walker family was audio recorded. Uh, I went back to documenting the vehicles, and when Miss Taylor's mom, uh, Miss Palmer, arrived the, to the scene, I went back to that same location where the Walker family was at, uh, and you know, I had a. A tough conversation with her about um, you know the condition of her daughter um, so and there was a lot you know obviously there's some emotions involved in that um, but I, I explained to her kind of what the process was we gave her the uh, the name of the corner who's going to oversee the case um, we offered um, chaplain we have deputy chaplains that are volunteers for our police department uh, from from almost every faith. Um, we offered shelter because it was, it was kind of chilly that night. Um, we have canopies. The uh, crime scene unit uh, has canopies we could have provided them shelter with. Um, 
but there was no doubt. It was clear that Brianna was still in that apartment, um, deceased. It was a very hard conversation. Once the crime scene unit arrived, then did you begin processing uh, apartment four and yes. collecting evidence? So not immediately processing inside, um, but we, we began our, process, our scene processing with the exterior scene um, for obvious reasons. I mean, there, that's, a, that's a scene that you can less control, if you will, because you have people living in a community that have to go to work, they have to. They have obligations. They have to leave. And you can't necessarily, um, you know, unless it's directly going to alter evidence. You would not necessarily be able to stop them from leaving, going to work, and whatnot. Um, but most ev most everybody that, that we that I had contact with was um, willing to cooperate in any way. Um, so. Once the uh, crime scene unit arrived, there were photos taken, exterior and interior. Yes. So, uh, have you had a chance to review um, those photos before coming to testify today, which have been marked Commonwealth Exhibit One through sixty-nine? Yes. We've gone through each and every one of those. Yes. And. Do they fairly and accurately detect the scene, both exterior and interior, as it was that early morning hours of March 13, 2020? Yes. So, would you like to look, me to look at each one of them? Yes. Okay. If you would now turn your attention to the screen behind you and with the pointer, do you have the pointer there? And this is exhibit one. Would you explain what we see here? So this is apartment four and this is the opening to the first four apartments and the second floor apartment apartments. Um, there's this, you can't see it in this photo, but there's a white Sequoia Toyota Sequoia that uh, belongs to the brother of this, uh, the person that occupies this apartment eight. Um, that you later learned was Mr. Sarpe? Yes, Aaron Sarpe, he was the civilian involved in this. Okay, go ahead to exhibit two. Exhibit two. Just a, a, a clear picture of the same picture. I believe the street light may have turned on uh, or she may have changed her photography. Um, but the same 3003 Springfield this indicates apartment four right here. And still seeing the sequoia over on the right-hand side. Correct. The grill of the sequoia. So exhibit three. So this is a further east photo. This is the white sequoia that belongs to Aaron Sarpy. This is uh, Sergeant Jonathan Maddenley's police vehicle. 
uh, not his typically assigned police vehicle, but the one he was operating that night. Uh, and obviously this is uh, medical uh, care uh, equipment. Um, and this is apartment four. And so the, the vehicles had not been moved. It was still a crime scene. No, and actually Mr. Sarpy uh, was just there to uh, get his young daughter and he, he got a different, he got a ride from someone else and agreed to allow, and he actually even gave us the keys, uh, allowed us to just kind of uh, yeah. deal with his vehicle, whatever we need to do with it. I see. Exhibit four. This is a, a, an east to west view. This is apartment four here. This is the Roto Rooter Vans, actually Mr. Sarpy's brother's uh, Stanley. Uh, his brother is his business van. Uh, and this is Sergeant Maddenley's vehicle, police vehicle. Mr. Sarpy's um, Toyota. This is a LMPD Mark unit. It's the Mark unit that was inside the scene um, when we got there. And this, again, this is 3003 apartment four right behind this van. Going to exhibit five. So this is apartment four. This is how we, we observed the entry door into apartment four when we got there. Uh, and this is apartment three. As you can tell, they're perpendicular to each other. And now, once more, would you step over to the easel and uh, flip over from Exhibit 76A and see if that is Exhibit 5A. No, you would be going forward. You would flip that over. And is that Exhibit 5A? Yes. That's the same photo that we see on the screen? Yes. As you can see, it shows more. So uh, we would move to exhibit, admit Exhibit 5A at this time. No objection. It'll be so admitted. Go on to Exhibit 6, please. So this is a, a gray uh, truck with a, a a bed lid, an acrylic bed lid, lid or fiberglass bed lid um, on top of it. And these are like little orange arrows that indicate that there's ballistic evidence present. Uh, and this is, bef this is an overall before we, uh, we put markers down, uh, which is one of the first or the next initial step in scene processing. So those are bullet, as you later found out, casings. Bullet, spent bullet casings, yes. Spent casings. And point out where the sliding glass doors are in this photo. <laughs> yeah, so the sliding glass door, part four, is right here in front of this truck. Okay. With that lid on. Exhibit seven. So that gray truck is going to be immediately here outside the, the view of that photo. This is apartment four. That's the sliding glass door. And this is the, the window to that south bedroom. With bullet holes. With bullet defects in it, in, yes. Exhibit eight, please. This is a, a photograph of that sliding glass door. Um, it has bullet defect in it, um, not just in the window, but also in the uh, screen uh, material and the uh, interior uh, furnishings like the, the Venetian blinds, vertical blinds, and the, the curtains on the inside. <coughs> Exhibit uh, 10. It's a closer view of Nine. the same. I'm sorry. It's a closer view of the same uh, glass sliding door. It's hard to tell in this photo, but the, this, this uh, uh, screen material actually has very defined uh, defect in it. Uh, looking through that, you have broken glass uh, and then the, vene the vertical blinds and the, the uh, curtain, interior curtain. Give it 10. This is the opening to the apartment 3003 portion of that building. Apartment four would be right here behind these stairs. This is apartment three, uh, and this is uh, material or you know uh, Christmas decorations that uh, were at one point underneath the this staircase. And under the staircase is the is there a piece of evidence that's got some red on, under that third yeah, stair? So this is what they what uh, the criminal interdiction. Uh, members used to breach or, uh, you know, uh, get the door open to, with force. Uh, it's called a ram. It's got, I'm not sure what it weighs, but it's got, it's, it's heavy and it's used to breach doors. Exhibit 11. 
This is a, a you know a narrower photograph of the same opening breezeway, if you want to call it. Um, it's a tote that I believe had those Christmas decorations in it uh, that got moved around as a hat, and there, which you really can't tell in this photo, but there's ballistic evidence, there's spit casings and whatnot uh, in this photo as well. This is apartment three. Apartment four is just out of the uh, view of the photograph. Exhibit 12. This is a closer view of the same area. Um, again, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's numerous spent casings all through this uh, opening, and this is apartment four. 13. It's a close up of the door and the ram, um, the breaching tool, if you will. Um, again, you'll start seeing more identifiable uh, spent casings in this area. Exhibit 14. This is apartment three, two, and one, showing just the rest of a more closer up view uh, photograph of that area. Apartment four immediately to the east. Exhibit 15. So as you come into apartment four, immediately to the left is a dining room with a small kitchen area. And this area right here, just outside of the view of this photograph, is a hallway that leads to the south and east bedroom of that apartment layout. And where's the common wall with apartment three? This is common wall here. Runs all down through here. And could you point out where the door was breached, that where the ram hit? Yeah, so it was hit on the not on the opposite side of the hinge, uh, which is the way law enforcement breaches, they breach doors for obvious reasons. If you hit it on the hinge side, you're not going to get it open. <laughs> okay. Exhibit 16. It's the closer up of that door and it shows the, the, the damage uh, that the door sustained from the breaching tool. 17. This is an exterior and, and, and as we forward in time, um, obviously it got it, daylight, you know, the sun came up, we started having, uh, you know, where we could actually see and identify more things. Uh, and so we start putting down markers to identify certain pieces of evidence and identify general areas where evidence exists. Uh, and markers one and two, I'm sorry, one and three, uh, are, we'll see close-ups of them. Those are, let's just move on, we'll see close-ups. Okay, let's move to exhibit 18. Uh, so this is that same uh, gray truck. This is apartment four. And now these markers where you saw earlier, you saw the orange little rubber arrows. Uh, now we are putting down markers, identifying ballistic evidence or spent casings in the areas where the markers are located. Uh, 19. This is a, a photograph south to north. And as you can see now, the markers indicate where evidence is at. Uh, and unlike the other photographs, you, know, you couldn't really t tell where the, the spent cases were or, or other evidence. Uh, now the markers are identifying the, that evidence we're speaking of. And 20. Uh, this is the truck as well, that, that gray truck. And then this truck here, the van, is that roto Ruder van. This is a closer up of that series of ballistic evidence spent casings including one under the, assist, under the tire here um, that we were talking about. And for perspective, uh, the white Toyota Sequoia is just south of this view of, of the photograph, and then uh, Sergeant Madden Lee's police vehicle is just south of it. Now, each of those markers, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and nine you said was under the tire? Correct. And each of those markers marking a casing later testing proved to be fired from Hankison's gun. Correct. 21. This is a photograph west to east, uh, again identifying that roto Ruder van. Uh, With the same markers. Displaying the same marker numbers, sequential numbers. 22. Uh, so this is markers identifying uh, other evidence, uh, this is a, a, a spit magazine from uh, one of the involved officers. Uh, marker one, I believe, was a spent casing. I can't tell in that as photograph. As well as marker three. 
as well as marker for rating, yes. Those casings as well, uh, later testing showed to be fired from Hankison's gun. Correct. They were federal spent, they were federal brand spent 40 caliber casings. Exhibit 23. Another picture of or a photograph from south to north uh, showing uh, on the opposite side of that gray truck, um, which would be the west side of that truck, if you will. Apartment 4 is up here, uh, that sidewalk that's right south of, immediately south of the, of the glass uh, sliding door. And uh, 24. Same view, just, uh, just expanded up and further north. Uh, showing the perspective or positioning in relation to that sliding glass door uh, in markers. And four is another casing. It is. It is a spent 40 uh, caliber federal casing. That was later found to be fired from defendant Hankison's gun. Correct. Uh, 25. This is a close-up view of that spent casing. Identifying marker, marker one. 26. Spin casing, identifying marker four. 27. Spin casing, federal casing, identifying marker three. And 28. Spin casing, identifying it with four. And 29. It's a spin casing that was right under that, that front right tire of that Roto Rooter van. Uh, identifying it as marker number nine. And 30? Uh, marker 10, spent federal casing. And 31. So these were casings that um, that we identified as uh, casings that were obviously weathered. Um, you know, in, in, in an urban community, uh, people celebrate on 4th of July and New Year's Eve, they fire weapons. Uh, and we don't have no way of determining that that's when that occurred, but it's not, the reason why I bring it up, it's not uncommon uh, in, in apartment communities to find ballistic, spent ballistic ammunition um, in my experience. So because this was such a, a vast ballistic, had so much ballistic evidence in the scene, uh, we, we determined that there was no way we could not collect it uh, with the evidence that we were collecting in, in this shooting, but did not believe it was associated to the shooting because of the obvious physical uh, traits of the, of the casings. Okay. Now that is uh, Exhibit 31. Uh, if you would also step over to the posters once more and flip over that one which I believe is 5A. Now is this uh, Exhibit 19A? Yes. And you've already testified about Exhibit 19. And is that the same photo as 19? Yes. And is this one 31A the same as the one currently on the screen? It is. Uh, okay, we would move to Exhibit, admit Exhibit 19A and 31A. No objection. They'll be so admitted. Now let's continue on to Exhibit 32. Uh, it's a not so close, I mean, it's an a, uh, overall picture, if you will. It shows in relation to marker 11 and 12, that is the south bedroom window with obvious, it's kind of hard to tell in this, this photo, but there's obvious bullet defect in the glass and there's a, a defect down here the uh, aluminum siding and, and substrator material, building material. And again, uh, those markers, are those the, you said the weathered uh, material or casings that you were not related to the shooting? Yeah, because of their obvious physical characteristics, it, it, it didn't appear that they were related, but that we needed to uh, collect them as evidence because, you know, obviously we're not um, scientists and we can't do examinations on scene, so to, to abundance of caution, we, we collected it as evidence. 
33. This is uh, the number four, or apartment four sliding glass door. This is the, that sidewalk that leads to the uh, opening, common area opening to that apartment that portion of the building. Uh, and there was casings in here identified by the markers. In uh, 34. This is a, a photograph west to east. And as you can see, that this portion of 3001 uh, was, was uh, secured with police tape all the way across the parking lot to the next south building. Where's the police tape? Right there in the picture. Right across, it goes across the uh, sidewalk here. It actually extended across the parking lot over to uh, the, the, the immediately south uh, apartment building, you know, across the street from 3001 and 3. Uh, exhibit 35. This is the common area opening of that part, that, the 3003 portion of that building. Uh, apartment 4 here, 3, 2, and 1. Just showing the overall with the markers down. And 36. This is a, another perspective. So it shows uh, marker 19 on the staircase going to the second floor of that building in relation to the sliding, the glass, sliding glass doors and the uh, other uh, weathered casings, if you will, on that, that uh, handicap access uh, ramp or sidewalk in relation to the apartment floor. Exhibit 37. Closer up of the markers within that common area, including the tote. And it's typical that uh, CSU techs would, would be, you know, they would take these wide range photographs and then they get closer and closer and closer to kind of show perspective of the evidence. And if you would point out marker 37 up there. Marker 37 right here. And marker 37 uh, is that place occupied by a, a bullet? Yes. And that bullet later uh, designated uh, by the department as uh, item 65, which we'll see a photo of later. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. So with C CSU reports or Louisville Metro Police Department CSU reports, you have a marker number, you have an exhibit number, and then if it's sent to the lab, you'd have a lab number. So it's this one piece of evidence can have three separate pieces of num uh, three numbers, and sometimes it's confusing. I mean, I had sometimes I have to lay it out for myself because I, I get confused. And so that marker 37, later numbered uh, <clears throat> LMPD number 65, uh, was tested by both. Kentucky State Police and the FBI. Yeah, so um, initially this projectile uh, was always believed to be the projectile that that struck uh, Sergeant Manley, that went through his, his leg. We have a forensic report within the, within the investigation that, that kind of shows the, uh, the trajectory of that projectile in his leg, um, and it was consistent uh, with uh, the ammunition that we believe that the gun, the, the gun that fired it. So, uh, and it was ultimately identified that bullet as having been fired from the nine millimeter found under the bed in the south bedroom. Correct. Not through serology, but through bull ballistic Ballistics. examination. Okay. Did you find any defects in the foyer or anywhere else? indicative of uh, automatic fire or ARs or long rifles or anything like that. So there was, if this is the west wall of that opening, apartment one and two, there was no defect uh, observed in this plastic siding at all. What about inside the apartment? No defect. No defect from any, any projectiles traveling east to west. Traveling out the door out the door and in direction east to west. And that is the only bullet that item or marker 37 that was found that was identified as having been fired from that gun in the, in the apartment under that bed. Yes, there uh, yes. Um, item or exhibit 38 
spent casings. And the RAM again. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at that. Uh, yes. Uh, markers, identifying spent casings, and the breaching tool, the RAM, in relation to apartment four. And 39. Um, the lock, uh, the lock mechanism or the assembly for the door um, identified as mark, marker 22. Uh, 40. Uh, shows the other markers uh, closer to, this is apartment one. Uh, apartment 37 is that projectile we just talked about. Um, and then it just shows the relationship in that of the markers to the ap apartments. Remember it's two, three, and it's four. And these were all, all these other markers, 26, 27, 28, 30, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. Were those placed there to show where casings were retrieved? Yes, where spent casings were located at. Spent casings. Yes. And did later testing all show that those, all of those spent casings were fired from the guns of Mattingly and Cosgrove. Yes. Exhibit 41. Um, entry door to apartment four. Um, obviously there's a cell phone there, marker 33, and then spent casings in the remaining uh, marker numbers. Including 39? Yes also a spent casing. Correct. 42. Uh, marker 36 uh, shows the strike plate uh, of the lock assembly or door assembly uh, of the entry door to apartment four. And 43. This is a closer up of marker 37. This is a projectile that went through Sergeant Manley's leg. And 44. This is the opening to uh, entry door to apartment four, showing the perspective of these markers, the cell phones, and the marker 39 and the foyer of that door opening. And that's a casing at 39. Correct. Which was identified as either Mightingly or Cosgroves. Correct. And 45. This is the south bedroom window, um, showing the defect in the glass and defect in the aluminum substrate or, you know, uh, trimming, trim, whatever, uh, the window. Um, and each defect has a scale in it, showing its size. 46. This is a projectile that was located, it's marker 47, was located in the south bedroom, um, dresser that was on the other side of the window we just yeah saw. yeah so it's if you went through that window it'd be in as a dresser on that the wall that separates the south and east bedrooms and that projectile there's defect on the front drawer of that dresser and that projectile was found just in that in that, that top left drawer Uh, 47. Marker 47, yes. Uh, well, and also, we're now going to exhibit 47. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the uh, glass sliding door, uh, and this is a closer up uh, photo. And, and, and some of the glass had fallen too, so it makes it easier to see in the photograph by this time. Is it the, this net or the screen material uh, showing the different defect in the, the screen material? with the scales next to it. And just for perspective, this goes into the living room area, apartment four, traveling south to north. How many bullets were determined to have been fired through the sliding glass door into the dining room, either the dining room of apartment four, the wall of apartment, the common wall of apartment four, or into and out of apartment three. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the first part. How many bullets total went through this glass sliding glass doors? Five. Five. All of which later testing showed were fired from Detective Hankison's gun. Correct. Uh, exhibit 48. 
Here's the sliding glass door again. This is that gray truck we talked about. Uh, and just showing perspective, uh, and this is actually a, a photograph we took before we got to where we were putting down markers in relation to that south bedroom we just talked about. Forty-nine. This is the hallway. Uh, when you come into that apartment and the door swings open, you are immediately, you know, you see immediately down that hallway. Um, and this is Miss Taylor the back of the hallway we'll get to this the layout but but this wall it, there's a cutout or not cut out but it kind of recesses back to where there's an offset for that opening to that south bedroom and you walk in uh, and then the master bedroom if you will the east bedroom is that opening we can barely see here um, and there's a bathroom and a utility closet uh, to the left here so the south bedroom that we saw is to the right yes. uh, of, of Ms. Taylor. Correct. The doorway. The doorway. Right. There's, a, there's an offset, so the hallway comes down here, and because there's a closet in that south, man, stand up, man. Can I stand up? Because there's a closet in that bedroom, there has to be an offset to allow for that closet in that bedroom, um, which is why the way it's set up this way. So, you would have to turn right and it'd be I mean, maybe a couple feet, three feet difference as you would go, come into that the opening of that bedroom. And where is the doorway to the east bedroom, which is Ms. Taylor's? You can barely see it, but you can see the striker plate there for the, of the door uh, knob assembly, uh, but that's, that's it right there. And then there's a wall there at the end. Yeah, so at the end of this the hallway, on, in the exact, on the opposite the opposite side of that wall, there's a closet that is in that east bedroom. Okay. Uh, exhibit 50. Exhibit 50. This is a, a photograph from north to south, uh, taken from the, if you were standing next to the dining room table, uh, looking towards that, that uh, glass patio door. And this is the living room area. And I... Um misspoke this is 51 i think 50 was removed because i believe it was another photo that we decided to remove so this is 51. now those drapes uh on the other or if you pull the drapes back the, the vertical blinds are there yes there's vertical blinds and some of them had fallen from the bullet defect or damage that the bullets caused, um, projectiles caused. 52. So this is the, you know, flip the other way from south to north. Uh, this is the obviously the door the opening uh, to apartment four, and this is that common wall between four and three, and here's that, that dining room table we spoke about, um, and then the love seat here, TV, and then on the back side outside of the uh, photograph would be the glass uh, uh, glass patio door. 53. Same, this is with a door closed or cl almost closed uh, with scale scaling, uh, showing defect in that common wall, uh, defect on the dry, the dining room table from a bullet defect or from projectiles. So there are how many bullet holes there can we see? There's three. And one uh, on the chair, the defect? Yes. And then later on, we, we'll see that there's a projectile laying on the ground next to the dining room table. And uh, exhibit 54? These are closer ups. And then in, in this photograph, you see another additional uh, bullet defect or projectile path through that common wall. So that accounts for the five shots through the sliding door. Correct. One that hit the chair that we saw, and then this one above the chair rail there. Could you point that one out? That's the second one, and then the third, fourth, and fifth. And this is the common wall into apartment three. This is a common wall from four this is a, the apartment four side 
and the projectiles would have passed through the common wall into the apartment three north of apartment four. Exhibit 55. This is some of the damage caused by the projectiles on the dining room table. 56. This is a, a view outside of that glass standing on the on the patio. The glass had, by this point uh, had fallen, uh, and it's a view inside the apartment showing defect on that common wall. As if you're standing, you're standing in front of the sliding doors. Correct. Yes. Taking this photo, and where's the front door then? Front door's here. In the hallway. Hallway's here. It's kind of hard to tell because the walls are all black <coughs> white, but that's the hallway. The hallway that leads to the bedrooms at the end. It's the hallway, yes. 57. 57 is that, that dresser drawer in the south bedroom showing the projectile, and this is the damage that that projectile caused uh, when it entered the south bedroom uh, window. Um, and it, 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 you know, that's where it, it, it was found. That projectile was later determined to have been fired from Detective Hankison's gun. Yes. Exhibit 38, uh, I'm sorry, 58. This is a projectile that's found in the utility closet um, just out, just north of that hallway um, where it, it penetrated the, the drywall or um, substrate in landed and rested right there where we found it. And also later determined to have been fired from Detective Hackison's gun. Correct. 59. This is the, uh, this is the South bedroom. So it's kind of hard to tell, but you can tell there's an offset here. This is, if you were standing in the hallway, looking into the South bedroom, this is the, the black, uh, like blacked out uh, curtains uh, with blinds behind it. Uh, and this is that dresser um, that, that we talked about with a projectile in that top left drawer. The reason why this bed is up like this is because uh, when SWAT came in to clear the apartment for uh, threats, um, they identified a, the weapon, the 9 millimeter weapon we spoke about earlier, uh, and they kept it up like that so it would be visible to investigators as they came into the apartment. Would you point out the window there, and that's the other side of that the outside window with the bullet defects. Yes. And so that's a shade or a curtain? It's a curtain with blinds on the back side of it. So there's blinds immediately on the on the window, if you will, and then there's like that's like a, a fabric curtain uh, or, or you know it may actually even just been this fabric that was pinned to kind of black out the room uh, for light purposes. And there were there bullet defects in the blinds? Yes. In the curtain? Yes. Uh, exhibit 60. This is a projectile was found in the bathroom. It's a, a fiberglass insert bathtub uh, tub and shower combo. Uh, it just was sitting here on this soap shelf. Um, you know, projectiles are, uh, they, you know, it's, it's it's weird how you you know you find things and you're just how did it end up there? I mean, of all places, but as it travels through material, it changes in velocity, it changes in shape, and, and it's unpredictable. And that bullet later determined to have been fired from Hankison's gun. Correct. The bathroom being across on the other side of the hallway from the south bedroom. Correct. Exhibit 61. This is that gun we spoke about. This is the bed. It's been propped up in the south bedroom. Uh, and what type of gun is that? Pistol is that? It's a Glock 9 millimeter. Exhibit 62. This is that same window that had bullet defect from the exterior into that dresser where we found a projectile in that top left drawer. Beds up, guns on the floor. It just shows the uh, curtain, if you will, or material that's covering the blinds of the window. And 63. That is a sequential bolt defect from the window uh, to the drywall. Uh, so what we did was, and you'll see this maybe in later pictures, uh, where we have we identify them in, in 
numerically in letters. Um, so we correspond the defect in the window to the defect in the drywall, and we did that using a laser. Uh, and we use like, a laser to go through the window. We can't use rods because you can't put rods in glass. You can tell about se like uh, sequence in glass, but in this case, the shot pattern of the glass was was expanded to the point where each it didn't it didn't alter the glass like it didn't it didn't collapse the window. So each shot was identifiable, and the laser identified the corresponding or sequential defect coming from the window. From the window. So this it gave you a trajectory. And that's the door to the south bedroom that goes into the yeah, hall. Yeah, so it's the, the window south, sorry, south, north. This is a door that goes into the hallway, so it's going south to north. 64. It's marker 44. It's the Glock 9 millimeter handgun. And that was obviously collected as evidence. Yes. Um, 65. Uh, this is a handwritten note uh, that we found that was correspondence uh, between Brianna Taylor and Jamarcus Glover. 66. It's the same envelope uh, showing the correspondence between the two parties. In, found in the apartment. Correct. 67. Uh, these were bills uh, in Jamarcus Glover's name um, from these companies. Found in the apartment. Found in the apartment. 68. Marker 40. It's a, uh, a fragment of a, of a projectile. And it's the projectile that struck the uh, dining room table. That we saw earlier that hit the chair and then uh, was found on the floor. Yes, right on the floor, right next to the table. So it never made its final resting place <clears throat> was uh, apartment four. Correct. 69. This is a, a further back view or wider expanded view of marker 40. It, it's really hard to tell where that, that, that fragment is, but it shows a relationship between the table and the and the marker number. And the fragment was <clears throat> later testing revealed to be have been fired from Hankison's gun. Correct. <clears throat> We have, um, and you, you said that contact was made with uh, the residents of apartment three and photographs were taken uh, by the crime scene unit. Um, we have already heard testimony from uh, Cody Etherton and seen the majority of those photos, but there are three of those photos uh, that I'd like for you to look at. So 106 is a photograph of the living room area of apartment three, showing def obvious defect to that, that glass uh, storm uh, glass uh, sliding door. Exhibit 107 is the defect that the uh, dining room table in apartment three sustained from projectiles traveling through that common wall, uh, and then. Exhibit 108 is just a, a further back view of the same table, showing the, pers you know, the perspective of that of Exhibit 107 in relation to that dining room table. And the <clears throat> the bullet is laying on the table. Correct. In front of the computer. Correct. And those photos fairly and accurately depict the scene as it was uh, early that morning. Yes, ma'am. Would move to ex admit Exhibits 106. 107 and 108. No objection. They'll be so admitted. Did you move to admit 1 through 69 minus exhibit 50, or were you not ready well, to now do that? If yet? I didn't 
moved up at one through one through 49 and 51 through 69. Any objection? No, Your Honor. All right, they'll, they will be so admitted. Counsel, would you approach for a moment, please? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a pretty long day, heard a lot of testimony. I think it's, this might be a good time for us to go ahead and recess for the evening. Um, we'll return tomorrow morning at 930 um, to hear further testimony in the case. We had talked with you about going to the scene. The weather is not looking very good for tomorrow. It looks like there's going to be a lot of rain. So we're going to hold off until Friday just in case you all wanted to make some plans in terms of going out there. You will be transported by the Sheriff's Department. I was talking about in terms of what shoes you might want to wear, what you might want to bring with you to go to the scene. So we'll probably go there Friday afternoon rather than going tomorrow. All right, so I will see you tomorrow morning at 930. Please remember the separation admonition. All rise with the court and jury and uh, And you can step down if you'd like, um, and then we'll see you back tomorrow. Please don't discuss your testimony with anyone since you are still on the witness stand. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, in terms of whether we're going to have the trial on Monday, I, I guess it depends on how far did, did we get as far as you would hope that we would get today. Are we already behind? witnesses that would testify after uh, the 10th advance. Well, then maybe we should, can we just make that decision tomorrow regarding Monday? And um, we'll ho hopefully have a better sense of how we're, how we're moving along with the witnesses. All right. Anything else? Nothing, Your Honor. Okay. See you tomorrow morning.